everyone. This is Western Civilization. I'm Dr. Young, your instructor. Um, we're going to pick up the narrative today uh, with the abdication of Diocletian, uh, who we talked about, of course, at the, uh, the end of last class. Um, and uh, we're going to talk specifically about his main successor, who is Constantine. Um, uh, Constantine both continued some of the programs of Diocletian and obliterated some of them. Um, and this happened uh, as follows. Diocletian abdicated in the year 305, um, and he probably did so for two reasons. One, he, he probably wanted to see if the system that he had created, the Tetrarchy, uh, was really going to work. He wanted to make sure that it was, it was going to outlive him, so to speak. Uh, but a second reason that he did it was that um, uh, he, he was probably under a great deal of pressure from the, uh, the two Caesars in the realm, uh, Galerius and Constantius, uh, to finally step down after 20 years of rule and let the Caesar become the new Augustus. Um, and uh, Galerius may have even threatened him a little bit uh, with potential rebellion uh, against his rule. Um, and so Diocletian not only abdicated or retired, um, but he also forced um, Maximianus, who was his co his co Augustus, the other Augustus in the West, uh, to abdicate at the same time. Now there's some question of whether Maximianus was ready to do this. He seems to not have been ready. This was more coerced kind of thing, uh, and he tries to reinsert himself uh, somewhat later at a few points. Uh, and, you know, in the immediate aftermath of these abdications, uh, things seem to be working very smoothly. Uh, Galerius became the Augustus in the West, and Constantius became the Augustus in, sorry, in the East, and Constantius became the, the Augustus in the West, and uh, they each chose a new Caesar uh, who would succeed them, and everything, you know, seemed to be working out. Uh, and it all was great until about a year later, when Constantius died very suddenly, and the people in the West, and especially the troops of Constantius, because remember, all of these men are military generals, um, and their power base lies in the military, um, the troops of Constantius were not keen on supporting this new um, Caesar, whom they didn't know, and so they instead proclaimed Constantius's son, Constantine, who was also a very able military commander, uh, to be the next Augustus. And all of the other members of the Tetrarchy cried foul. They said, this is our place to do that. Uh, you know, the troops can't do this. This is this is return to the, the third century chaos where the military was dictating who got to be emperor and who was deposed. Um, and so this led, this touched off a new cycle of civil war. Um, and the long and short of it is that Constantine emerged as the victor. That's not a um, that's not a story that can be told in a few minutes. Um, there, you know, there are a number of battles involved in this. Uh, we're going to simply say that he, uh, over about a fifteen to twenty year period, defeated all of his rivals and once again consolidated rule. Uh, under a single emperor. Now, Constantine did note that Diocletian was on to something when he created the Tetrarchy, and, and uh, that dividing up the rule of the empire was probably a good policy. And so he tended to share power with his sons. Uh, he had three uh, sons who he each gave a piece of the kingdom to rule, um, mostly autonomously. Um, but he did not grant them, uh, as Diocletian had done, these uh, grand titles like Augustus or Caesar. Um, and uh, Constantine seems to have expected that his sons would sort of fight out uh, among themselves over who got to succeed him, um, which is to some extent what happened. Um, so he consolidated rule under a single emperor again, though with some uh, things left over from the Tetrarchy. Uh, Constantine did a number of other things of note. Um, you know, if, if Diocletian get, lent the uh, empire um, some life support, uh, you know, to, so it would survive the crisis of the third century, Constantine extended the reach um, and the effectiveness of the dominate um, and uh, really made the Roman Empire great again, it could be said. Um, 
uh, similarities to any political slogan there um, uh, are totally unintentional. I don't know why that just slipped out, but um, uh, that that's uh, that was Constantine's um, uh, his his accomplishments were were truly grand. Um, now I'm going to go through a few of these. Uh, one of these is that he built. Well, he built a number of cities, um, or rebuilt a lot of cities, but um, he built a city in the east, um, which would in time become a kind of new capital of Rome. Um, it wasn't during the life of Constantine, and there's some debate over whether he actually um, expected or, or planned for this to happen. Uh, the city um, was built over uh, the site of uh, an ancient Greek police um, on the Dardanelles Strait, that waterway that runs between the Aegean and the Black Sea. Uh, this was a supremely defensible location. There's a little peninsula that extends out into the Dardanelles. Um, and so it, if you build some, some walls, um, uh, you know, decently strength walls on the, the sides of the water, then you can protect it from any invasion via ship. Um, and then if you build really strong walls, as Constantine did, on the, the only side that is exposed to land, you have a virtually impregnable fortress. And, in fact, uh, it, it became such. Um, so it was built over a Greek police known as Byzant Byzantium, uh, but Constantine, of course, renamed it after himself, calling it Constantinople, or Constantine's city. Um, and Constantine recruited people to go and live in this city. He, uh, he, he and his successors incentivized people with monetary gifts, with pro promises of privilege and power, uh, if they would move from Rome um, to go to this new city. Um, and over time, uh, Constantinople came to have all of the features and all of the kind of social hierarchies that existed in Rome. Um, though it was different in some respects, specifically that it was a Christian city rather than a pagan city. And so there, I'll have more to say about that, um, that topic in a minute here. Uh, so that's one of his contributions. Um, another is military reforms. Constantine took the very static defensive uh, formations uh, and structures that Diocletian had uh, bolstered and altered them and created these armies that were um, flexible and could move very rapidly from one part of the empire to another and thus handle any threat that cropped up more efficiently and the army in fact became much more effective under Constantine. Economically, um, Constantine uh, succeeded to some extent where Diocletian failed. Diocletian simply imposed these price ceilings and price floors on, on uh, goods and services uh, Constantine decided that he needed to, re I mean, the, the best policy would be reforming the monetary system entirely. Um, the, you know, the coins had been water, had been uh, debased over time, had been weighed down with base metals, uh, which is really one of the, sorry, um, my standard yawns during these things. Uh, one of the things that led to the greatest inflation, and so Constantine um, uh, produced a new coin known as the Solidus. It was made of gold. Um, and, uh, you know, this helped to stabilize the currency and the whole economic system to some extent. Uh, now, most importantly, in terms of, of kind of long-term impact, was Constantine's relationship with Christianity. Uh, and there are legends associated with this. It's, you know, I think it's essential for us to be acquainted with these legends, um, and the, but then, you know, to treat them in an analytical fashion, in a critical fashion. Um, the legend goes something like this, and this is told by Christian authors who were, um, who were close to Constantine. But on the eve of one of the decisive battles that Constantine fought against the other rival claimants to the imperial throne, um, uh, the famous Battle of Milvian Bridge in the year 312, uh, Constantine saw a vision in the sky. Now this again is, is legend, right? There's no way to verify this historically. Uh, but he saw this vision, um, and this Christian symbol appeared to him. In some accounts this is a cross. In other accounts it's a symbol known as the Cairo, uh, which are just the first two letters of the name Christ or Christos in Greek. Um, anyway, a very potent Christian symbol. Um, and uh, he was told by a, a voice from heaven, buy this 
that is by this sign, you shall conquer. And according to the legend, Constantine took that as a direct message from God. He had that uh, symbol painted on the banners of his army, painted on the shields of his soldiers, and went into battle and was victorious and, and managed to take control of the city of Rome after the Battle of Milvian Bridge. And he proceeded in the months following that to issue an edict known as the Edict of Milan, uh, which gave tolerance to Christianity. Uh, Constantine seems to have been moved, maybe even, maybe we could even use the word converted, uh, to the Christian religion as a result of this vision he had. Now, one of the things that we should note, and I'm you know, going to go here to, um, uh, to a web browser and, and uh, take a look at these um, assigned sources that you were supposed to read for this week, uh, Constantine was not actually the first one to do this. Galerius, who had been the greatest persecutor of Christians during the great persecutions, uh, Galerius was Diocletian Caesar in the east, um, and a particularly uh, you know, strong opponent of Christianity. Uh, in the year 311, he had um, uh, he issued an edict that... Um, gave tolerance to Christianity, or at least kind of contramanded the, um, the standard order of hunting down Christians and executing them. Um, and one of the things that he notes in this is that, um, you know, when our law, that is the law that made Christians Ill Christianity illegal, had been promulgated to the effect that they should conform to the institutes of antiquity, many were subdued by the fear of danger, many even suffered death. Right, so lots of people were killed, but then he says, yet uh, since most of them persevered in their determination, and we saw that they neither paid the reverence and awe due to the gods nor worshipped the god of the Christians, uh, in view of our most mild clemency and the constant habit by which we are accustomed to grant indulgence to all, this is sort of standard boilerplate language for uh, Roman emperors, by the way, we thought that we ought to grant our most prompt indulgence also to these, that they may again be Christians and again and may hold their conventicles and they, you know, ought to pray to their God for our safety, for that of the Republic and for their own, right? So, um, so Galerius had issued this, uh, maybe somewhat reluctantly, but um, the persecutions had, had mostly ended. Um, that is often forgotten because Constantine's issuing of the Edict of Milan was far more famous, even though it came after Galerius. Uh, but he essentially makes Christianity legal, uh, says Christians are not to be persecuted, um, and, uh, you know, this is, this is an important step uh, in, the, in the history of the relationship between the Roman Empire and Christianity. Now, it goes even further. Um, Constantine, uh, throughout the rest of his life, the, you know, the next 25 years that he continued to live, uh, time and again kept meddling in the affairs of Christianity. And I use the word meddling with some hesitation there. Um, it's difficult to know why he did this. There are plenty of cynics out there and say he's just doing this entirely for political gain. But if you look at it, um, you know, the, there were still probably only 3 to maybe 5% of the population of the Roman Empire at this point who had converted to Christianity. It's not like he's going with the majority position here or something like that. Uh, perhaps he saw this as a, a kind of unifying mechanism for his empire, um, but there seems to be more to it. Um, on the other kind of extreme is the notion, and I don't know that there's necessarily um, that this is necessarily uh, erroneous, but um, that Constantine was legitimately converted to Christianity and did these things because he uh, was invested in the religion. Right? The cynics would then counter and say, well. You know, he was conflating Jesus with uh, the Sol Invictus, the unconquered sun, which was a popular uh, god in Rome at this point, um, and uh, he didn't really understand what he was what he was invested in. Um, other cynics might say, well, he's you know, um, he's just doing this to appease uh, certain people he's close to, or or whatever it is, right? Um, and you know, some also point out that Constantine was not baptized until he was. Baptized as a Christian, that is, until he was um, uh, almost on his deathbed. Um, but that was not necessarily um, out of out of character for this time period. That was that was actually quite common 
for Roman elites who had been invested in Christianity for some time to finally undergo the uh, you know the right of entry into the faith when they became old and, and uh, uh, decrepit, so to speak. The most famously, so Constantine was was invested in Christianity. Um, he spent a, a good deal of time and effort um, trying to um, you know make sure Christianity was in good shape. Uh, most famously, he called for a council in the year 325 to be held at Nicaea. Um, and uh, so the Council of Nicaea um, is one of the signal moments in the history of Christianity, arguably in the, in the history of Western civilization, uh, because this represents the kind of, you know, uh, bringing together of the Christian religion and the Roman Empire. Uh, the emperor presided at this council. It was a meeting of Christian bishops. Uh, bishops were heads of local communities, usually, you know, cities. Uh, so the Bishop of Alexandria, the Bishop of Antioch, the Bishop, anyway, all, all the major cities had bishops. Uh, they all showed up to this meeting. Why did they go there? Well, Constantine noticed and he probably was informed about this and, and uh, by, by lots of people, that Christianity was not a united religion at this point. Um, there's some question of whether it was uh, kind of from the beginning, but, um, uh, and I, I talked about, you know, last uh, lecture about how uh, even the, uh, you know, close disciples of Jesus seem to have argued uh, among themselves over the proper form of Christianity. Um, but Christianity was not a united religion. Uh, there were many different forms that Christianity had taken. It had, after all, uh, existed for three centuries at this point in a Roman Empire where Christians were uh, in, at times persecuted and, and where they didn't want to operate in too public a fashion. Um, and the challenges of transportation and communication were such that, you know, there was no uh, real structure in place to keep things centralized and uniform or anything like that. So the form of Christianity, the, the beliefs, the practices, the liturgy, the, the uh, organization, and all of that um, differed uh, depending on location. The, the Christian church in Alexandria was much different than the Christian church in, in Asia Minor, say, or in Rome. Um, and this was a problem, as Constantine saw it, because if you know, he's going to invest all of this time and effort in Christianity for whatever reason he had. Uh, he wanted this to be something that uh, was coherent. And so the purpose of the Council of Nicaea was to settle some of the most important debates that were going on in Christianity. Um, a couple of these, uh, just to give you some examples. One was the, the proper date for the observance of Easter. Um, that had been debated for some time, even um, quite vehemently, uh, one might even say violently debated uh, among different churchmen. Um, another issue was which books, which writings uh, of the uh, early Christians to put in the authoritative version of the Christian scriptures. Um, and uh, that was something that was debated upon and, and determined upon in the um, uh, Council of Nicaea. Uh, most importantly, though, was a, an intense debate taking place over the nature of God, um, ideas about who God was, what his makeup was, what, what, what constituted his being. Uh, and Christianity, you have to understand, is of all the three major monotheistic faiths of Western civilization, that is Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, by far the most theologically complicated. Because it claims to be monotheistic, while at the same time having references to three beings who all have claim upon divinity. Uh, there is a God the Father. There is also Jesus, who is uh, described as, or, or uh, you know, given the title, the Son of God. Um, and the meaning of that, of course, is open, you know, has been open for debate. Um, and then there's this other being called the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost. Um, and, uh, you know, so there is one God, but uh, there are really three gods. And you know, the Jews and others would, were accusing Christians of not being true monotheists, of worshiping multiple deities. Um, and so this, you know, and this had really sort of blown up into a major debate with lots of different players. Uh, one 
uh, individual in particular um, uh, from Antioch, a guy named Arius, uh, had argued that Jesus was not actually the Son of God. Um, and uh, there was some nuance to that, but uh, Arius' position was, was in the minority, it was controversial, and the Council of Nicaea ultimately weighed in on this, rejected Arius' ideas, um, and uh, accepted a version of God that we know as the Trinity, um, and even put into place what is known as a creed, um, a statement of belief that Christians have been reciting now for 17 centuries. Um, and uh, it, it's mixed, actually, with some other creeds, um, but it's known as the Nicene Creed. Um, and that became the sort of standard orthodox, that's the right word, uh, that's a Greek word that just means, like, correct um, or accepted. Um, it became the orthodox version of uh, of that very important Christian doctrine. Um, so that was that was the Council of Nicaea, and again, that's part of Constantine's contribution. Those who followed after Constantine were all that is as emperors were all Christians, with one exception. His it's either his nephew or his great nephew. I, I always forget what it is. Um, but uh, the Emperor Julian, who reigned in the three sixties. So Constantine dies in 337, so it's about 20, 20, 25 years later. Uh, Julian became emperor, and he had been raised as a Christian. Um, ironically and interestingly, he reconverted, or rather he, for him it was a new conversion, uh, he converted to paganism, to the traditional Roman religion. And he even took some steps toward disassembling some of the Christian privilege that had been granted by Constantine and his successors. Um, and, uh, you know, Julian did a number of interesting things, actually. Um, but uh, only two years into his reign, he died in a war uh, against the Sassanid Persians. Um, and uh, that was that was the end of uh, end of Julian, and who knows what what Western civilization might have been uh, had he had a really long reign like Augustus Caesar did, or even like Constantine did. Um, most of the emperors who followed were more in the vein of Constantine. Uh, the other one that we should mention who's important is Theodosius, known as Theodosius the First or Theodosius the Great, uh, who ruled at the very end of the fourth century. He became emperor, I think, in 378 and died in 395. Um, Theodosius did two things of note. Uh, one, politically speaking, and we'll come back to this later, but he effectively divided up the, the Roman Empire into two political entities that were separate and autonomous from each other. Um, and this is really the kind of the ultimate conclusion to the changes that Diocletian had started to make a century earlier. Uh, but he divided the empire between east and west. He gave uh, one of his sons uh, the throne in the east and the other of, uh, of his sons, um, or another of his sons, I can't remember how many sons he had, another of his sons the throne in the west. Um, and the two empires were really never brought back together as a single entity again. Uh, so from this point on, there is an emperor in the west, and there's an emperor in the east, and they are each ruling independently of the other one. They're not kind of joined together uh, like Diocletian and, and the others in the Tetrarchy. The other thing that Theodosius did was issue a number, uh, several decrees uh, declaring effectively that Christianity was the official religion of the empire, and that Christians could even disassemble pagan temples uh, so that they could use the building materials to build churches and other Christian structures. This is why, uh, this is frankly the main reason why most of the uh, temples uh, from the Roman period have been destroyed, um, why they're lying in ruins all over the Mediterranean region. Uh, there is one exception, that is the, uh, the temple known as the Pantheon in Rome, uh, because it was, de it was dedicated to all gods, um, kind of a, you know, cover all your bases sort of building. Um, and so, you know, the Christians said, well, this one is dedicated to, uh, to the real God, to the Christian God, so because it's dedicated to all gods. And so we're just going to cleanse the building of any reference to the pagan gods and turn it into a Christian church, which is precisely what they did. So 
if you want to see a you know legitimate uh, uh, pagan temple from the Roman period, the, pa the Pantheon is really the only one left. Um, and it is, uh, by all accounts, a, a pretty spectacular building to see. All right, so what were the consequences of this for Christianity? That's one of the things that we want to look at here. We'll, we'll come back to the political situation in Rome in a few minutes, but um, you know, Christianity underwent uh, a kind of identity crisis as a result of this acceptance by, uh, by Constantine and by the Roman Empire. Um, up to this point, Given the uh, sporadic persecutions, and especially the great persecution uh, under Diocletian and Galerius, uh, Christians had developed an identity that was bound up with martyrdom. Uh, to live a good Christian life, many early Christians argued, one had to seek out and even suffer martyrdom. That was the quickest path to heaven. Uh, so this life was seen as a sort of transitory phase that prepares one for uh, the afterlife, and a, and a good afterlife would be ensured if one died as a martyr for the faith. Well, when Constantine accepted Christianity and, and made it legal, and then sort of took up the leadership of it as emperor, uh, the opportunities for martyrdom largely disappeared. Um, there were still Christians who went off to, who left the Roman Empire entirely, went off to Sassanid Persia, or into uh, Africa, or, you know, um, uh, up into the German lands, or something like that, so that they could seek martyrdom. Um, you know, many, there were many Christian missionaries moving into places where Christianity had not made it at, the, at this point, um, and uh, sort of welcoming martyrdom if it came, but those were, those opportunities uh, were much fewer than they had been previous to Constantine's uh, issuing of the Edict of Milan. So, what's a Christian to do, or rather, what is the collective Christian church uh, supposed to do now that martyrdom really isn't uh, uh, an option, and, and thus no longer the, uh, the path that they can talk about that would ensure one gets to heaven? Well, uh, there are a number of things that the Christian church did. First of all, um, this whole period sees the uh, further development, um, really kind of the solidification of the clerical structures of the Christian church. They formed clergy. Uh, the fancy theological term for this is ecclesiology. They really, really worked hard on the ecclesiology of the church. Uh, that is the church government, the structures of it. The most important officials up to this point, and they continue to be important, were bishops. That is, heads of local communities, mostly urban communities of Christians. Uh, Christianity was largely an urban phenomenon still at this point, and so you know, there were powerful bishops in places like, as I said earlier, Alexandria and Antioch and uh, increasingly Constantinople, of course, Rome, um, Milan, uh, and other kind of major cities uh, in the empire. Um, there were, however, uh, some debates over which of these bishops uh, should be seen as primary in authority. Um, and uh, without going too much into detail here, uh, there was this notion um, you know, that came from Christian legend that the authority that Jesus had given to his early apostles, and specifically to Peter, uh, who was seen as the, the chief apostle, the one who Jesus favored most. Um, there is, a, in fact, a passage in Matthew chapter 16 where Jesus sort of, you know, shows Peter special favor, says to him, uh, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom, um, uh, really the keys to the church, and, and uh, um, you know, you're, you're in charge, so to speak. Um, and so, you know, the, the question was, who now has the authority of Peter? Does anyone have it? Does a single individual have it? Uh, how does all of that work? Well, it just so happens that Christian legend held that Peter had, toward the end of his life, gone to Rome and set up a community of Christians there and had become the first bishop of Rome. And thus, uh, the proponents of this idea claimed that the current bishop of Rome also held Peter's authority and thus was the head of all Christians. Well, the, uh, the Bishop of Rome was also known and came to be known over time as the Pope. Um, and so that structure was put into place. Um, 
And generally speaking, in the Western part of the empire, um, or in the just simply in the Western Empire as of the late fourth century, uh, the Pope was hailed by many Christians, maybe most Christians, as the central authority in Christianity. In the East, that was not so much the case because the emperors there were much more powerful and much more stable. And so there it was argued by, by many, at least, that the emperor was the one legitimately in charge of the Christian church. Um, and that uh, you know there were a number of bishops who were sort of of equal rank. Um, and the, the term actually they developed was the, the, these were the patriarchs. Uh, the bishops of Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome uh, were in that in the Greek Orthodox uh, tradition equal in authority. Right. So not everyone hailed the Pope as the as the key authority. And in fact, uh, the, you know the popes didn't sort of gain this reputation uh, why in any kind of widespread fashion until probably at least the fifth century. Um, and it really kind of is cemented in place by Pope Gregory the Great, who I'll say more about later, uh, at the end of the 6th century. All right, so that's one thing. Now, back to the notion of martyrdom. Um, there were Christians who began to propound a new, or it's not really new at this point, but um, a, a form of life to replace martyrdom that uh, met all of the heroic requirements of martyrdom, though from a different perspective. Uh, and this is where we see the origins of monasticism. Now, uh, for, for to understand how monasticism takes shape, we have to go back to the probably the, the middle of the third century or so, even before the great persecutions of Diocletian, um, and specifically to a guy named Saint or Anthony, um, uh, Anthony of the Desert, otherwise known as Saint Anthony, uh, he lived in Egypt, um, and you know was born into a wealthy family, enjoyed the, the comfortable lifestyle that went along with having wealth. Uh, but when he reached his twenties, uh, uh, Anthony decided that all of the pursuit of wealth was really quite corrosive to his soul, um, and that uh, he needed to do something extraordinary to prove his love for God. So we had this conversion experience. Uh, Anthony left settled society, went out into the desert. Um, and there's plenty of desert, of course, around the Nile Valley, so it wasn't hard to find one. You just start walking west or start walking east, and you pr pretty soon you're going to be in desert. Um, he found a cave there. There are all sorts of legends about what Anthony went through during this time. Uh, but he took up the life of a hermit. And uh, according to all kinds of stories that were circulated around Anthony, uh, all kinds of miracles started to occur as a result of Anthony's choice. There were animals who brought him food. Uh, God you know, provided shelter for him miraculously. He, he uh, was healed of diseases. He, you know, people who went out to visit him were healed of diseases. Um, and so you know, Anthony attained this reputation for being a holy man uh, and he was not alone in this. In the 3rd and 4th centuries, there were a number of figures in Egypt and in, uh, in the Levant, kind of in the, in the Syrian desert, in the Arabian desert, uh, who did things similar to Anthony. That is, leave settled society, go out into the desert, and try to eke out an existence as a hermit, really just relying entirely upon God for everything. Um, this illustration here... Um, this bronze plaque icon thing, uh, is an illustration of one of these hermit figures. Uh, this guy's name was Simeon. Uh, according to legend, he was early 4th century. Um, uh, Simeon went out into the Syrian desert, climbed up on top of a sandstone pillar, and stayed there for 30 years. Never came down from the pillar, relied upon God to send rain so that he could have something to drink, uh, to send food. Uh, in this... Uh, instance, you've got this massive serpent who brings Simeon food in his mouth. So nature, you know, God who controls nature is providing for Simeon. Now, what happens with these holy men, these desert fathers, as they're also called, is that they began to attract large followings. People went out in the desert seeking the cave or the pillar of an Anthony or a Simeon um, and uh, began to uh, try to imitate that lifestyle such that there developed communities around these holy men. 
And uh, ultimately, some figures in this setting who began as hermits recognized that they needed to make provision for these uh, sincere followers. Um, and so they began to write a set of guidelines for the governing of community. Uh, these came to be known as the, as, as the rule uh, of a monastery. And this led ultimately to the, to the uh, formation of these institutions called monasteries. Uh, these are communal things, but really they uh, take their cues from these uh, desert fathers in that they try to live a life of solitude. Monks remain silent most of the time. Uh, the only time they open their mouths usually is when they pray or chant um, in, in praise of God. Um, uh, they live as a community so that logistically they're better off, but uh, they kind of still pursue this life of solitude. As one of my teachers described it, they live alone together. I think that's an apt description. Um, and monasteries, uh, the monastic life, became the model that really replaced martyrdom as the one that would ensure Christians the easiest, straightest path to heaven. Um, and, you know, monks attain this reputation for being truly holy, uh, and, you know, people who were not monks came to rely on monks um, to pray for their souls, uh, such that monks, you know, filled this, this kind of essential position, as it was seen, um, in uh, Christian society. Okay, um, one other um, point here on this slide, um, is, and that's the point of heresy. We talked about Bishop Arius at the Council of Nicaea. Um, and mentioned that he was uh, opposed to the idea that Jesus was the Son of God. He even argued uh, forcefully uh, about this in his writings and at the Council of Nicaea. Uh, his version of Christianity was um, rejected by the, by the Nicene Council. But uh, Arius did not go away. He was not arrested or executed or anything like that. And in fact, he continued to teach these things, seeing his version as the legitimate Christian one. Um, and thus developed a movement known as Arianism. This is not to be confused with Arianism, by the way. This isn't a proto-Nazi or anything like that. Uh, that is spelled A-R-Y-A-N. This is A-R-I-A-N after Arius. Okay. Um, and there were a lot of adherents to the Arian form of Christianity, even after the Council of Nicaea. Um, Constantine himself may have been more swayed by Arius. There's some debate about that. Uh, one of his sons... Constantine II was a very committed Arian Christian, um, and the Arians were most notable for sending missionaries north uh, across the Danube River to the Germanic-speaking peoples and converting them to Christianity, and as we're going to see, the Germans then come into the empire in huge numbers, bringing with them Arian Christianity, um, which you know they had received from, from Romans. Um, so Arianism was a tremendously influential thing uh, uh, for several centuries. It was one of a number of heresies. These heresy means improper belief. It actually it comes from the Greek word which means choice, um, but it has the connotation of you know making the wrong choice. Um, improper belief, improper practice, uh, heresy, something that is condemned by the Orthodox or the, the Catholic, the Universal Church. Um, and there were lots of uh, heresies uh, that, that, you know, sort of grew up in late antiquity. I'm not going to go into the details of those, um, though I personally find this subject quite fascinating. Uh, but uh, Christianity, in other words, does not, is not unified even, you know, with the efforts of figures like Constantine and the Church Fathers. Um, there still are several different versions, several different forms of Christianity, um, and uh, heresy is something that you know doesn't go away for a very long time. In fact, arguably, um, kind of never goes away in Christianity. And so there were uh, multiple church councils called in late antiquity and points beyond. The, the Nicene Council was not the only one. Now there's another big council in the year 451 in a place called Chalcedon, um, and uh, you know debating again uh, issues brought up by the presence of heresy. Uh, this remains um, uh, a point of, or, or kind of a, a source of tension and also creativity in Christianity uh, for centuries. And I'll, I'll have more to say about heresy when we talk about the Middle Ages. So, as one scholar describes it, even after, you know, the, uh, 
uh, the efforts to unify the church, we still have these micro-Christianities, each individual community having its own form of Christianity, some of these accepted within the pale of orthodoxy, others uh, rejected by, uh, by that pale. Now, um, uh, just a couple more points about the Western Church, uh, more along cultural lines here. This period is famous for the activities of uh, these individuals, Christian clergymen mostly, um, who were known as the Church Fathers, um, and the fancy theological term derived from the Greek and Latin uh, is uh, the Patristics. Okay, so this is the era of the Patristics, the Patristic Fathers, uh, the Church Fathers. Um, some of these, and, and you know, this is not limited to four individuals, though I will talk about four in particular, um, but uh, there were church fathers who wrote in Greek, uh, there were church fathers who wrote in Latin, there were even church fathers who wrote in other languages like Syriac, um, which was the language of uh, you know, uh, Syria during this period, what is now Syria during this period. Um, in the West, which is our primary concern, uh, the Western Empire in the 4th and 5th century and 6th centuries, uh, there were four individuals who outstripped all others in terms of their, uh, you know, their prolific writings, their contribution um, uh, theologically and philosophically and, uh, you know, in terms of church organization and practice and things like this. And so these are known as the four doctors of the church. Uh, the most famous of all of the uh, the church fathers. Uh, the first of these, Ambrose, was the Bishop of Milan um, in the, uh, the second half of the 4th century. Uh, interestingly about Ambrose, he got into a spat with the Emperor Theodosius, the very guy who effectively made Christianity the official religion of Rome, and, and uh, Ambrose was so forceful in his condemnation of some of the things that Theodosius did that he uh, threatened him with excommunication. I mean, that's kind of ironic. Uh, and Theodosius backed down. And that, that's the kind of personality that uh, that Ambrose had. He could even cow um, a powerful Roman emperor. Um, Ambrose made a number of contributions. It's difficult to sum them up. Uh, he did a lot. Um, and he wrote on, you know, just about every imaginable theological topic, as all of these men did. Um, he also uh, really put into place a lot of the kind of structures of governance of the Christian church, um, and, you know, did a number of other things that are, are of import. Um, uh, Jerome, who was pictured here, uh, this is a statue of Jerome outside of his tomb in Bethlehem, uh, in what is now uh, Palestine. Uh, uh, Jerome is most famous for uh, accomplishing a Latin translation of the Bible, the entire Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, uh, from the for the Old Testament, he learned Hebrew from uh, studying with Jewish rabbis, and uh, translated it directly from Hebrew. Uh, this was an important step because there were earlier translations of the Bible into Latin, but they were there was no uniformity to them, and many of these texts had really, you know were they, they were not translated from Hebrew. They were translated from the Greek translation of the Hebrew, uh, which perpetuated some errors in the text. And Jerome was concerned about this. And with the uh, support of the Pope of the time, uh, he um, spent you know twenty or thirty years very carefully translating that text. Uh, Jerome's version was written in um, in not in uh, high cultural Latin, but in a kind of street language. It's known as the Vulgate because uh, it was written in the vulgar language. That's not to say it has a lot of swear words in it, but rather that it was written in the language of the street, the language of the common people. Um, and over time, it didn't happen immediately, but over time, this became the official kind of authoritative version of the Bible. Um, the most important of these four, by far, and truly one of the key figures in all of Western civilization, is Augustine. Uh, Flagler College is, of course, located in the city of St. Augustine, uh, which is named after this guy. You can pronounce it either Augustine or Augustine. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's a personal preference. Uh, I was taught to say Augustine, so I'll say that. Um, but uh, Augustine was the greatest philosopher, um, arguably since Aristotle, uh, or at least since um, Plotinus, in uh, the Neoplatonic philosopher of the uh, earlier and late antiquity. 
Um, and, uh, you know, probably the most influential Christian theologian, not only of late antiquity, but arguably of all time, um, uh, even you know, sort of outstripping St. Paul and some others, perhaps. Um, it's very difficult to sum up Augustine's contributions uh, in, in a brief time span. And so let me just talk about a couple of these. Um, uh, for one, Augustine was a very strong proponent of a uniform church. Uh, his, he's, you know, I think that we could attribute the, the uh, term Catholic, which means universal, uh, to Augustine, because he saw the Christian church as something that needed to be unified under the leadership of the Pope um, and uh, remain uniform as a result of that. Uh, his most widely read work is called The Confessions, um, which is simply his story of uh, his conversion to Christianity and all the things that he had to go through. Uh, it was, it's been a widely read work uh, for the last uh, 16 centuries or so, um, probably one of the most widely read works in all of the history of Western civilization. Um, and we learn from that that uh, you know he started out life as a pagan. Um, his mother was Christian, his father was not. Uh, he pursued a number of different paths, different forms of Christianity, uh, you know, even got involved in some quite erratic and sinful behavior from time to time. He was, uh, he felt, he felt very guilty about this, and that comes out in the confessions. Um, but ultimately, partly with the uh, um, the prodding of Ambrose, with whom he became acquainted when he lived in Italy. Uh, Augustine was from North Africa, but he spent a lot of his time in Italy when he was young. Uh, he became a, an Orthodox or a Catholic Christian. Um, and then took up a life of, of study and writing uh, of Christian theology and philosophy. Um, Augustine is maybe most known for his chief contribution. Well, let, let, me, let me talk about two things briefly. Um, he was enamored of the philosophy of Plato and saw it as coherent with um, Christian theology. And one can perhaps understand why. Uh, because Plato existed in the realm of ideas. He saw ideas as, as more real than, than uh, material things. And so, you know, in, you know for, for Plato, the ultimate reality is in what he calls the forms, um, which are the, the kind of, you know, base ideas out there in the, in the ether somewhere, right, with no physical manifestation to them. Well, it's not a, a far step from, from the, the notion of the forms to placing the forms in the mind of a divine being. And the Neoplatonic philosopher Plotinus had gone uh, some way toward this uh, when he talked about this entity called the One that contained within it all of the forms and was the ultimate existence in the universe. Um, and so Augustine simply modified that and said, well, the One is God. Um, and so God is the source of all of the forms and all of the realities in the universe. And he effectively brought about a kind of synthesis of uh, Platonic philosophy and Christian theology. Uh, another very important contribution of Augustine, and important especially for the purposes of this class, is his version of history, his view of history. Constantine saw history not as cyclical like the, the Greeks and Romans had done, uh, but rather as linear, uh, proceeding from a definite uh, beginning point to an end point. The beginning point for Augustine, of course, of human history is the creation. The end point is the end of the world, the second coming of Jesus. Um, and history is laid out on a line. Uh, this comes out in his most philosophically profound work, which is known as The City of God. Um, uh, I think a truly great uh, read, honestly. Um, but uh, also very long, so students, I think, probably tend to shy away from that. Anyway, uh, his, his version of history is, has become the standard view of history that is as something that proceeds al along a linear fashion. Now, Gregory is the fourth of the Church Fathers. Uh, of the four, he is the only one who became Pope. He was Pope at the very end of the 6th century, so he's a, a bit after the other three. Um, a kind of bookend church father to the uh, period of late antiquity. And Gregory's contributions are also multitudinous. Um, for one, he really set the pattern of what it meant to be a pope. Um, he wrote on theology. Uh, he was particularly important for um, laying out patterns for delivering Christian sermons. Um, 
Uh, and, you know, Gregory also set the agenda for the conversion of pagan peoples to Christianity, um, which is something I'll talk about in a later class uh, when we talk about the early Middle Ages. So I will return to Gregory. He truly is a, a tremendously important figure as well. Um, Christianity took over a lot of the functions that the Roman government and other uh, Roman institutions had performed for centuries. Um, and this was due to the weakening, especially of the Western Empire, to the advancement of uh, Germanic groups who came into Rome and, and uh, you know, took over large parts of the empire. Um, and the Christian church, you know, over time gradually came to uh, fulfill um, the, the responsibilities that the government had. As the government was kind of fragmenting, uh, the Christians were, were you know, taking, taking charge. In many cases, like uh, Ambrose of Milan is a good example of this, um, uh, the uh, people who had, in, a pre in the previous generation, held important positions in the Roman government, um, a, this people from the same families, uh, would be, once they became Christian, take up positions of leadership in the Christian church. They would become bishops and archbishops and popes and abbots of monasteries and uh, would continue to perform the functions that their family had in government positions previous to this point. Um, but they just did it as Christian authorities instead. Uh, the Christian church also was responsible for education, uh, such as it existed at this point. And Really, this gets us into a tremendously important topic, which is the survival of the classical heritage. Uh, the, the works of Homer and Plato and uh, Livy and, and Plutarch, um, and, uh, you know, I mean, we could sort of go on ad nauseum about all of these important literary and philosophical figures of antiquity, were preserved only because Christian scholars, mostly monks, decided at some point that their work was worth preserving. There were Christians who argued that the classical heritage ought to die because it, that is the classical philosophical and literary heritage, because it was man-made. It was not from God. Um, Christian scripture was from God, and so it should not be challenged for authority. Uh, so, you know, uh, the, the, the Church Father Tertullian in the um, uh, late 2nd, early 3rd century, was famous for saying, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? In other words, you know, what do sacred things have to do with all of this secular, pagan, uh, classical stuff, right? Not everyone felt that way. Augustine, for one, was a great scholar of uh, Latin literature. Um, he loved Latin. He also could read Greek, uh, but he particularly loved Latin. He loved to read Virgil and Ovid and, and these great Roman poets. Um, and, uh, you know, borrowed a lot of his stylization, uh, his, his uh, form in writing, uh, from the classical heritage, and uh, argued, and he was not alone in arguing this, that uh, the classical heritage ought to be preserved. These, these literary works ought to be preserved because they had valuable things in them. They should not be taken literally, of course. There, there were no, you know, multiple gods and heroes and all of these things. Those were invented fictions, but... Uh, you know, the, um, the kinds of things that could be learned from a hero like Aeneas or, or um, a Hector or, or Odysseus or somebody like that, although Christians, I will say, did not like Odysseus much, um, but uh, were commendable, right? And moreover, one could learn to read Latin um, from reading these things. One could learn how to write and speak in Latin effectively by reading an Ovid or a Horace or a Juvenal or somebody like that. Um, and so the attitude the Christians had was we need to mine these works, this whole tradition, for things that are valuable and simply leave out, de-emphasize the things that are obviously wrong, that talk about pagan gods and things like that. Right? And so we see this amalgamation between the classical heritage and sacred texts, the Bible and the writings of the church fathers. These end up, you know, kind of being studied by Christian scholars alongside each other, and, uh, and that, you know, kind of culminates in the establishment of a, a kind of a more or less standardized curriculum in the West, uh, in monasteries, um, that taught both of these. Um, 
and uh, it was these Christian scholars who formulated uh, what were known as the liberal arts. Uh, you know, a scholar pursuing education in a monastery or in a school in a cathedral or something like that uh, would first study um, uh, grammar, that is how to, how to use the language, uh, what the language was, uh, was about, what its rules were, um, and then rhetoric, how to use the language effectively, how to write well, how to speak well, um, and logic, um, those are what is, are known as the trivium, or the three kind of base disciplines of the liberal arts. Uh, logic, um, how, to, how to argue, um, how to think philosophically. And then once one had mastered those things through the use of um, a variety of texts, some of them pagan, some of them Christian, then one could move on to the study of other things like um, mathematics and music and astronomy and geometry and those are the four kind of classic, what is known as the quadrivium, uh, the second tier of liberal arts. Um, but uh, we shouldn't take those necessarily literally. All of this was uh, studied, all of this education was pursued so that one could become a more effective monk or a more effective bishop or, or something like that. Uh, so the Christians took up the, you know, the, the role of education uh, along with other things. Um, and the church began to fulfill all of these roles, uh, particularly in the West, as the West began to fragment. Okay, I'm going to stop there um, because uh, I fear that this lecture will run on too long if I don't do that. So in the next lecture, I'm going to talk about the political situation um, starting in the late 4th century and run it through um, the, the end of the 6th century or so. Um, and I included in that, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to uh, give... Um, some some information, not an exhaustive list of information, but some information about the Byzantine Empire, uh, which is really just the uh, the Roman Empire that survives in the East, um, more or less intact. Okay, uh, so uh, I will see you in the next lecture. Thanks.